Hello, I hope you can hear me. So thank you for joining us for the first BIH multi-omics lecture. My name is Philip Mertins. I'm the head of the proteomics technology platform at the BIH and the MEC, and I will be your moderator for the seminar. Before we start with the seminar, I would like to make some housekeeping uh, announcements. So since this is an online lecture, please make sure that you turn off your webcams and also your microphones that we can ensure a good transmission. Um, we encourage you to ask questions, but please do that in the chat function and direct the questions to the organizer. Uh, please also note that this lecture will be recorded for our website. And if you want to follow us and uh, new, new BIH activities on Twitter, you can see here our Berlin Innovation and BIH lecture handles on the starting slide. We're, re we're really excited to welcome uh, Professor Tamar Geiger today with us. And before we start, I want to give you a, a short introduction. Tami Geiger started at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel, where she completed her master's and doctoral degrees in biochemistry. There, she was supervised by Professor Alexander Levitsky and studied with him changes in signaling networks during early stages of progression of cervical cancer. In 2008, she moved to the laboratory of Professor Matthias Mann at the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry in Munich, where she specialized in proteomics technology and applied it to cancer research. During that time, for example, she developed a very widely used technique called SuperSilec that is very useful to quantify alterations in the cancer proteome in a very accurate manner. After her postdoctoral stay in Munich, she moved on in 2011 to become a faculty member at the Sackler Institute of Medicine at Tel Aviv University. There she's, uh, she was proceeding and until now also with clinical proteomic research of breast cancer, of melanoma, ovarian cancer, and pancreatic cancer with an emphasis on metabolic changes that occur during cancer progression and also an integration of the proteomics data with the genomics data. In her studies, she asked questions related to cancer progression, drug response, tumor heterogeneity. And in addition to her research work, Tommy is a member of, a, of the steering committee of the, young, of the Israel Young Academy. One of the reasons why we have invited Tamar Geiger is also because she published last year very exciting studies that will be of interest to many of us. Uh, in this study, she studied uh, the immune response of melanoma patients. Uh, that were treated both with cellular therapies and also antibody therapies and uh, described the proteome changes and alterations in these different patient cohorts. And a really exciting, uh, exciting finding there was that she could connect metabolism, especially of mitochondria, to response to immune therapies. So this cell paper is a must to read, I would say, and uh, we're looking now really forward to Tommy Geiger's talk and to the discussions afterwards. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you fine, Tommy. Thank you. Yeah. I just need the privileges to share my screen. All right. Can you see the screen now, my presentation? Yes, we can see the screen. OK. Uh, so thanks a lot, Philip, uh, for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm very excited uh, to give this talk. It's a pity that I cannot come to Berlin. I definitely would prefer to be there uh, than here, uh, given the situation, but uh, that's what we can do. Um, all right, so uh, as Philip said, we are really interested in clinical proteomics with emphasis on cancer research and asking ourselves how we can apply uh, proteomics to answer very critical questions uh, in cancer. 
and I want to start basically in the beginning, what motivates us, and, and these are a few numbers that I stated here. So there are 40 million new cancer cases per year worldwide. 38% uh, of us are going to be diagnosed with cancer. And the grim reality is that uh, in the last 10 years, there was only uh, about 1.5% reduction in cancer-related death. And what are the treatment options? Um, so starting from the oldest, uh, probably surgery and chemotherapy, then more modern targeted therapies and the latest immunotherapy. Um, but despite having all of these options, we are still left with this reality and with many biomedical questions. So, for example, how diverse are the tumors? How dynamic are they? To what extent do they actually change? Uh, why can't we diagnose cancer early enough to cure it? And why can't we actually cure all cancer cases? And the answer, or one of the answers to most of these questions lies in the tumor heterogeneity. Um, and I'm talking about three main layers of diversity or heterogeneity. There is the diversity between the patients. Uh, so obviously, even all the patients who have breast cancer or, or melanoma or lung cancer, each patient is different from the other. Then there is another layer of diversity, which is between different regions. So if we look, for example, at this H&E staining, we can take different regions and we'll see a bit different phenotypes. But even within these regions, there is also diversity between adjacent cells, so within dif between different cells within each region. Uh, and the idea, or our idea, as well as many others, is to perform global and unbiased molecular characterization of human tumors to unravel novel cancer vulnerabilities. So the idea that I share with, with really hundreds of others uh, is that if we look and if we understand everything that is happening in the, in the tumors, we can also find answers to very critical uh, clinical questions. Now, obviously, and I don't have to emphasize this to this audience, but uh, most of the work related to global omics characterization of tumors has been done on the genomic and transcriptomic levels. Uh, but what we are adding is the proteomic layer. Um, and as we all know, it's closer to the functionality, and therefore we um, assume that it has it's more highly correlating uh, with the tumor phenotype. But beyond this, um, actually the heterogeneity within the tumor is actually reducing when we go from genomic to transcriptomic and proteomic. So if the genomic layer is, is much controlled by stochastic events such as point mutations and chromosomal aberrations, some of them have actually no uh, output whatsoever, this is reduced when we go to the transcriptomic and even more when we go to the proteomics. Uh, and this is, makes it actually easier to find uh, um, molecular events associated with clinical parameters looking at proteins rather than genes and mutations. Now, in today's talk, I want to um, address these layers of diversity. Uh, I'll start with diversity between patients, focus on breast cancer classification and drug response, diversity between regions, uh, in breast cancer, intratumor heterogeneity and diversity between cells, uh, and I'll focus on uh, melanoma, and this will be a bit more method development related. So starting with uh, breast cancer classification, it's probably one of the most studied topics using omics techniques uh, in cancer, uh, and this is just a figure from one of the landmark mRNA or genomic uh, studies from the TCGA. Uh, this study uh, reinforced the existence of four main uh, breast cancer subtypes, luminal A, luminal B, HER2, enriched, and basal-like, and they associated each one of these subtypes with uh, point mutations, as you can see here, as well as with uh, other clinical features such as estrogen ER or progesterone PR uh, expression level, HER2 expression, as well as copy number alterations such as or two, for example, and many others. Um, with the accumulation of 
breast cancer clinical data in my lab, we decided to actually try to challenge the existence of these uh, four subtypes looking at proteins. So everything that was done before, or most what was done before was done on uh, mRNA expression level. Uh, and after recapitulating known differences between these uh, subtypes, we actually took all the data. We started with more than 200 samples. Eventually, the analysis was done in about 130 uh, samples. And we performed um, unsupervised consensus clustering of all of these uh, tumors, and we found four clusters. So you can imagine, or we, you can think that probably it recapitulates the mRNA ones, but actually when we compare these clusters, so consensus cluster 1, 2, 3, and 4, CC1, 2, 3, 4, we compare them to the clinical classification, we could actually see that CC4 is clearly triple negative, so it doesn't express ER, PR, or HER2. Uh, however, when we looked at the HER2 positive tumors as classified in the clinic, we actually could see that they split between the four different clusters, uh, so they don't form a, a clear separate cluster. While we have three uh, ER positive clusters, uh, some further examination showed that CC1 was actually luminal B. It had high proliferative markers, high Ki67, but we were left with CC2 and CC3, which were both luminal A uh, clusters. And interestingly, when we compared our data to uh, RPPA, so proteomic protein-based uh, tumor data from the TCGA, we could reproduce the existence of these two luminal A clusters. Uh, and we could also see that one of these clusters can be associated with uh, resistance to tamoxifen resistance. Um, now, next, we wanted to see whether we can in a supervised way, ask whether we can see this cluster uh, on the RNA level. And what we saw is that this is the proteomic data and the comparison of the CC2 the, and CC3, the two luminal A clusters, we could find more than 660 proteins that are significantly different between these two clusters. And when we take the same genes and ask what is happening on the RNA level, and here you can look at the luminal A region, you can actually see no clustering whatsoever, uh, no, no clear separation, which means that uh, um, these, these two subtypes cannot be seen on the RNA level. This is also the reason why they weren't found before. Uh, so we can actually see uh, protein-only classification of breast cancer with potential clinical relevance uh, uh, with respect to tamoxifen resistance. Now, still focusing and with a lot of interest in uh, um, these luminal uh, tumors, uh, Anjana in my lab assembled a very unique cohort that studied response to drugs. So there is a critical question in the clinic uh, whether um, um, luminal tumors are going to respond to chemotherapy or not. And especially when uh, women come to the clinic with relatively large um, tumors, they're usually advised to undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy. That means that before having surgery, they, they get the chemotherapy. The chemotherapy is aimed to reduce, the sh to shrink a bit the tumor and also assess the future response to the adjuvant treatment. Uh, so they only take a biopsy pretreatment and then take out the tumor post-treatment. And what Anjana in my lab did is to assemble a cohort uh, of about 108 uh, tumor samples from 35 patients, uh, but the, the unique aspect of it is that every we had three samples from every patient, so normal ducts, pretreatment biopsy, and then the post-treatment tumor from each patient. So everything is is basically matched uh, samples. So we took these three samples per patient um, and ran all of these on the mass spec. Uh, and actually, we could uh, perform and, and analyze uh, the data in, in a relatively unique way that asked what is the pattern of change of each protein per patient. So each protein can have a specific pattern. For example, some proteins can go up from the normal to the tumor and then back down upon treatment, while in other patients, 
it can stay uh, relatively highly expressed also upon treatment, while there are other patterns that go down and then up or stay down and so on. Uh, and we asked uh, whether these patterns are associated with two uh, main clinical features. One is the tumor relapse and the other is the pathological response. And we know that when there is also poor pathological response, there is also higher likelihood uh, for tumor relapse. So we looked at these different patterns. So overall, we had uh, eight patterns, up, down, down, up, from uh, normal to pretreatment to post-treatment, proteins that stay up uh, despite treatment, stay down, and so on. So all of these uh, variations. And first of all, we, we wanted to see whether the number of proteins in each pattern for each patient uh, is associated with clinical features, primarily uh, at the uh, first place, recurrence-free survival. Um, so each dot here is a patient, and, and the y-axis is the percent of proteins in pattern one, two, three, and so on. And the x-axis is the uh, recurrence-free survival. And what you can see here is that pattern three, namely the proteins that are increasing in the tumor compared to the normal, but do not change upon treatment, uh, is negatively correlating and significantly correlating with recurrence-free survival, meaning that if there is a small change in the proteome, Upon treatment, there is also higher likelihood of recurrence of the tumor, which actually makes a lot of sense. So we were focusing a lot on these pattern three proteins as kind of a group of proteins that can tell us whether uh, a patient responded or not. And in parallel to looking at the recurrence, we also looked at the uh, pathological treatment response. And here again, you can look um, if we look at the H and E staining of the tumors, we can compare pretreatment tumors to post-treatment. And you can see that some tumors can actually almost completely disappear, uh, while in others there is hardly any change. But when you look at the tumor size, the tumor size is really similar, which means that it's really critical to look pathologically at the tumors. And this was quite a lot of work on the pathology side. Uh, but we could actually score each of the tumors in our cohort to Miller and Payne score one, two, three. Uh, and we didn't really have the high scores because there was no post-treatment uh, tumor uh, to analyze. So we're mostly talking about Miller and Payne score one, two, and three. And we could find hundreds of proteins that actually uh, follow pattern three in this case, so high and then stay high in the poor responders, but they are going following pattern one, meaning they go up and then down in the good responders. And, and further statistical analysis showed us that uh, uh, we can really see if we compare, this is pathological response, this is relapse, and this is these are the better responders, comparison of post and pretreatment, and these are the poor responders, you can see that most of these significantly changing proteins in the good responder don't actually change significantly in the poor responders, and that's also true uh, for the relapse versus no relapse. And overall, we had 150 proteins that were shared between the response to the pathological response and uh, the relapse and no uh, relapse changes. And we were very intrigued by a group of proteins among these 150 uh, because we saw a very interesting metabolic pathway that at the time was not studied very much, and this is the proline metabolism pathway, or proline biosynthesis pathway, actually. So this is the pathway. It's a relatively simple pathway. Uh, we start with uh, glutamate, and we go to uh, P5C, uh, which is then converted to proline. Uh, and the uh, glutamate to P5C is mediated by ALDH18A1, and P5C to proline is mediated by uh, PYCR1 or 2 in the mitochondria or PYCRL uh, in the cytosol. Uh, so this is the, the forward pathway, and there are also enzymes that catalyze the reverse reaction. Uh, and we actually saw ALDH18A1 and PYCR1 in many of our analysis 
uh, that hint that they are associated with um, resistance to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, we didn't see the similar things uh, in the opposite enzymes. We also see we also saw similar trends in other members like PYCR2 and PYCRL. And this is not a very common thing to see in proteomics that you actually see a whole pathway going and behaving in the same direction. Uh, so we decided to examine this functionally and we actually went to a very uh, a thorough uh, analysis of the effects of PYCR1 knockout. Um, and I'm showing you basically the last result. Um, uh, and we knocked out PYCR1 in different cell lines. I'm showing you here MCF7 because most of our uh, cohort was luminal tumors and MCF7 is a luminal uh, breast cancer cell line. And what we could see is that actually when we knock out PYCR1, we don't see a major effect on tumor growth in vivo. Uh, in, a, in addition, when we treat the uh, tumors uh, with chemotherapy, paclitaxel or doxorubicin, we actually don't see a reduction in tumor growth. And that's also fitting what is seen in the clinic, that luminal tumors don't respond very well to chemotherapy in the clinic. But amazingly, when we combine the two, so uh, PYCR1 knockout together with, uh, um, um, with, um, with a, a chemotherapy, we actually see a total eradication of the tumor, which was really, a, a, I have to say, a surprising. The effect was actually surprising and very exciting for us to see. And we are now following up on that to see uh, how we can develop further this as a potential combination therapy together with uh, chemotherapy in order to uh, increase this therapeutic response uh, in a neoadjuvant uh, setting. Um, so just to summarize this part, we saw that protein-based classification identify novel breast cancer subtypes with potential clinical relevance. Uh, and this subtype cannot be seen on the RNA level. And I showed you that the protein analysis of neoadjuvant clinical cohort identified the proline biosynthesis pathway to be associated with uh, drug resistance. But we're still left with very critical questions related to the ones I started with. So why do tumors vanish upon treatment? Uh, even when we target driver mutations, for example, most tu uh, tumors do not respond to it. Uh, definitely not completely respond to it. Uh, and why do often clinicians see differences between the primary tumor of origin and the metastasis or relapse tumors? And, and we understood that this is associated with the, with the internal uh, heterogeneity of breast cancers. And I'm giving you here a picture of one of the uh, tumors in, or part of a tumor in our cohort. Uh, this is h and &E staining, obviously. And when we zoom in on one in this part and stain it for HER2, we can see very high, very strong staining of HER2 and negative staining for PR, progesterone receptor. When we look at this region, we see very uh, um, low staining of HER2 and many PR positive uh, nuclei. And when we look at this region, we can actually see very low staining of both HER2 and uh, PR, and these are really a few millimeters away from one, one another, about one centimeter or even less. Uh, and this is actually very common, especially in large tumors that they are composed of multiple phenotypes within the tumor, and we decided to tackle this question, uh, try to understand this heterogeneity in a very challenging project, uh, which was run by uh, Maria in my lab. So in this project, what we did is to take uh, formally fixed paraffin embedded FFE blocks uh, and actually micro laser capture micro dissect regions based on their, their histopathological characteristics. So we took all the tumor, all the reach, all the parts of the tumors, so multiple blocks from each uh, clinical tumor, stained them for ER, PR, HER2, and cytokeratin. And then uh, mapped all the tumors based on these features, so the receptor expression as well as histological um, uh, subtypes. And we basically defined, with the assistance of a pathologist, we defined different regions and took each region separately to 
proteomic analysis, uh, using TMT multiplexing to increase, because we're talking about very, very small uh, sample amounts. Altogether, we had 30, 330 tumor regions from 35 patients, so on average around uh, 10 regions per patient. Uh, and I want to emphasize these are not just random 10 regions, but actually regions that a pathologist can see that they're different from one another. Uh, um, we also uh, took 50 lymph node metastases as well as 250 uh, stromal regions, which were not analyzed yet, so I'm not going to talk about them at all. Um, and just looking at these um, globally, um, First of all, only at the clinical features on the upper part, these are the molecular subtypes. So you have ER, ERPR positive, PR positive, HER2, triple negative, and triple positive. And at the bottom, we have all the patients. And what you can very clearly see is that most patients actually go to different directions. So they have multiple histopathological characteristics within a single tumor. What you can also see here uh, is that the, the triple negative R in general, you can see more homoge homogeneity in the triple negative uh, tumor. So you can see more tumors that are actually going to a single patient rather than split uh, in many directions, as you can see, for example, here. Um, now, from the technical point of view, we have a benefit that when we are looking at these small regions, we look at a much more homogeneous uh, population uh, and just to show that we can see when we compare the region-wise comparison between different subtypes, for example, hormone positive versus HER2 or versus triple negative or triple negative versus HER2, when we do it on the region base versus on a kind of pseudo bulk, uh, we can see many more significantly different proteins because we're not averaging signals of very mixed uh, population. So it's actually uh, much easier to get a very strong uh, statistically significant signal. Now looking overall at the proteomic data, we perform this uh, unsupervised clustering of the data. And what you can see here is uh, every line here uh, is a different region. Every color is a different patient. And we separated them according to um, some features of, uh, of subtyping. Uh, very roughly. Uh, here in the red dots, you can see how all the normal dot uh, regions, so you can see very nicely that they are clustered together, so the unsupervised clustering separates between those. We can see very nice separation between uh, the patients, but we can also see rough separation between uh, histological and molecular subtypes. For example, here they are triple negative breast cancer. These are hormone uh, positive. Uh, ductal, micropapillary, HER2, and so on. Uh, but when we look a bit closer, uh, we can see that for some patients there is actually very low correlation or large distance between different regions from the same tumor. So for example, for this patient, there are ERPR regions that are very distant from the triple negative regions just within the same uh, tumor. And same goes for the triple positive versus the ERPR positive. What we can also see, and this is very intriguing, it was very intriguing to us, uh, um, is that we have here a bulk of triple negative uh, uh, regions, but we can also see triple negative regions, here I colored them, all around, and these triple negative regions are actually embedded into uh, different subtypes. Um, Uh, they are embedded into different subtypes, and they're actually more similar to the other subtypes to the other triple negative regions. And what we could see is that these regions are coming from uh, homogeneous triple negative tumors, while the other ones are coming from heterogeneous tumors. Uh, and that's hinted to us that there is actually a difference between the uh, heterogeneous versus homogeneous regions, even if the region is coming from the same subtype. Uh, now, the next question that we were uh, kind of excited about, but uh, also a very challenging uh, question to address, 
uh, we wanted to build some kind of hierarchy of clinical features and to see which feature is most uh, influential on the proteome. So which feature, clinical feature, actually affects most the proteome uh, or the phenotype compared to the others. And we performed a canonical correlation analysis, which divides proteomic data to, in this case, seven, clinic, seven components corresponding to seven clinical features. And we asked which component, the component one explains the largest part of the, vari part of the data variation, uh, component two, the second largest, and so on, a bit similar to PCA. And what we could find, which was rather surprising, is that component one, or the most influential uh, uh, clinical features, is the histological heterogeneity score. So when we have very diverse uh, histologies within a tumor, it has the most dramatic effect on the proteome. The next feature was the molecular heterogeneity score. So if we have multiple subtypes, namely ER, PR, and HER2, and triple negative within a single tumor that also has a marked effect on the proteome, while, for example, tumor grade has, is third in the hierarchy as well as the individual uh, receptor expression levels and uh, cellularity. And you can see that this is also reflected in, uh, uh, if we look at the, in this graph, in these plots, that uh, we can really very clearly separate between homogeneous and heterogeneous uh, tumors based on the three, on the first components uh, of the CCA analysis. And just to show that, to get more into the details, we actually see, for example, for the ER and PR positive, hormone positive tumors, if we separate between homogeneous and heterogeneous, we can see hundreds of proteins that differentiate between the two. And very interestingly, we can see a lot of immune-related proteins that are associated with the homogeneous uh, population. And we have a lot of metabolic uh, uh, proteins associated with the heterogeneous ones. Interestingly, we also find PYCR1 that I just, and PYCRL uh, that I just talked about, but we still have to understand what it means. Uh, and for triple negative, we see a bit of a different uh, picture. The homogeneous has a lot of proliferative marks um, and uh, classical, I would say, metabolic enzymes related uh, to triple negative tumors, while uh, in the heterogeneous tumors, we see completely different uh, profiles, a lot of uh, multiple proteins related to glutathione and a lot of, uh, and the multiple also proteins related um, um, to metabolic enzymes that could be also related to luminal tumors, which could uh, also have uh, very interesting implications. So what I showed you is that the large tumor are composed of multiple histological and molecular subtypes, and that the internal heterogeneity affects the cancer classification and treatment response. I showed you that the topological proteomic analysis identified significant proteomic differences between homogeneous and heterogeneous tumors and uh, it, can, it revealed the fact of the immune system and tumor diversity, and this is something that we are digging deeper into to understand what is the interplay between the heterogeneity, between the stemness of the cells, uh, and between the immune system in order to understand how all of these uh, are affecting the, the, having such a major effect uh, on the tumor phenotype. Um, and then we are left with a few other questions. Uh, first of all, uh, when I talked about uh, homogeneity, are these homogeneous regions really homogeneous? How is the heterogeneity reflected on the single cell level? And what is the effect uh, of the immune cells on the tumor heterogeneity, which is related to what I just said? But we have a difficulty answering this when we look at kind of it's, it's not bulk tissue, but it's still regional or average uh, data. And when we talk about bulk samples compared to single cell analysis, of course, bulk samples, uh, we are averaging, we are looking at the main cell population or the impact of the uh, um, main cell population. Uh, but it's much easier. Technically, we can get deeper into the proteome, uh, better coverage of the proteome, 
Uh, and obviously when we talk about single cell samples, single, single cell analysis, uh, obviously we have a much better chance to understand heterogeneity uh, and look at rare cell populations, uh, but obviously we are facing a, a huge uh, technological challenge. Uh, and, and kind of inspired by the impact of single-cell RNA-seq, I think many proteomics people were, were struggling or thinking whether this can actually be done on, on the protein level. Um, and we want to address this in a, a, a kind of split addressing this in three ways. So first of all, uh, working towards microscale sample preparation, implementing the scope MS methodology that I'll explain in a minute, and moving and using these techniques, analyzing tumor cell populations uh, with a focus on immune and tumor uh, cell interactions. So, so really many people were inspired by the single cell RNA-seq, and many labs also thought that this would never be possible on, on the protein level. Um, but a couple of years ago, actually, uh, a couple of people started daring to, to do it. Uh, and the first publication by uh, Bogdan Budnik and uh, Nikolai Slavov uh, from Boston, they actually developed a method and showed that this is possible to a certain extent, at least doing the first steps towards that. And the idea here uh, is, is, I would say, even relatively straightforward, just nobody dared to do it. And this is taking single cells. Uh, there is a very well-established uh, multiplexing technique called TMT, tandem mass tax. Uh, we had 10 plex, now we have also 16 plex. They started with 10. We can put in each, uh, basically each, each cell can be labeled with a different a TMT label, and we can also have a carrier channel with 200 cells, for example. And we combine everything and run everything together. So the idea here is that we get the quantitative information of each single cell in a different TMT channel, but we boost the signal and the boost the identifications by having uh, uh, 200 cells as a carrier. Uh, and this is was the idea, and they showed this already in. in 2018 and, and earlier even in bioarchive, uh, and this methodology we actually implemented also in our lab, and we also implemented another very nice technique, very elegant technique that enables us to do very, very uh, sensitive uh, sample preparation uh, using a pair of magnetic beads that are carboxyl, um, carboxylated and the bond uh, uh, the peptides, the proteins, and peptides, and that gives us very clean peptides and um, with very high sensitivity, so we lose very little uh, material uh, using this technique. And what we did actually in the lab is automate the entire system on the Bravo liquid handler from Agilent, and we started by 96 well, uh, and then we moved to, recently we moved to 384 wells to further increase the sensitivity of all the signals. This allows us to really uh, analyze hundreds of cells uh, or, or do the sample prep for hundreds of cells per day. And setting up the methodology, going down from 1,000 cells, 500, 200, and, and, and 100 cells, we uh, with 1,000 cells, we reach more than 2,000 uh, proteins, and we go down and still hundreds of proteins from only 100 cells. Um, and what we are interested in is around 100 or 200 uh, region, which is going to be our carrier in the TMT multiplexing, and showing you another test, just analyzing 10 cells with a reference channel of 1,000 cells. We can see uh, reaching more than 1,400 uh, uh, proteins, and we can play, and, and we are still working on optimizing the methodology that would allow us to get the most IDs with highest accuracy, and we can very nicely separate between populations, which hints toward our ability to identify actually relevant biology, even with a relatively low number of proteins. And this is already going to single cells, and what you can see here is a carrier channel of 200 cells. 
and different injection times, uh, so some parameters in the mask pack itself, so we can, in itself, and we can already identify more than 500 uh, proteins, and here, when, when having two carrier channels, we can identify more than 800 proteins um, per, in, in a single cell, uh, which is really encouraging, uh, encouraging us that we will soon be able to apply this technology to uh, tumor samples, and this is something that we are still optimizing and, and improving on a, basically, one of the hottest topics in the lab nowadays. And the first project that we want to apply to is related to our interest in immunotherapy response, and also um, Philip uh, mentioned this uh, work uh, in the introduction. Uh, so we are very much interested interested in immunotherapy, melanoma immunotherapy response, and we have been working on two lines or two, two regimens of immunotherapy. One is adoptive cell therapy with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and the other one is checkpoint inhibitors, mainly uh, anti-PD-1 uh, treatment. And in the paper that we published about a year ago, uh, we assembled a cohort of 116 uh, patient samples from responders and non-responders to either TIL uh, uh, tr treatment or anti-PD-1 treatment. Um, these patients had uh, very significant differences in response, dif differences between responders and non-responders uh, uh, in terms of survival, uh, but the, all their clinical parameters were kind of indistinguishable. Um, and making a very long story short, and you can read all about it in the cell paper, we found two signatures that predict response to treatment. So the first signature predicts response to TIL, the second signature predicts response to anti-PD-1. In the anti-PD-1 signature, I have to say that we found relatively known uh, proteins to be associated with response, such as TAP proteins, tap BP. Uh, HLA protein, so basically a whole machinery that is associated with antigen presentation, and obviously higher expression of these proteins is associated with a uh, higher likelihood to be recognized by the immune system and higher likelihood to respond to immunotherapy. But surprisingly, in the TIL treatment, we didn't see any of these uh, proteins, but we did see multiple uh, metabolic proteins, several proteins associated with lipid metabolism, such as ACAT1, HADHA, ACAT1. And grouping and merging these uh, two data sets, uh, the PD-1 and, and TIL treatment together, we could see a, a hub of proteins, um, dozens of proteins that actually uh, are associated with the response to both treatment, both PD-1 and, uh, and, and TILs. Uh, and this hub of proteins was composed of two groups of proteins, the metabolic proteins associated with mitochondrial metabolism, uh, primarily lipid metabolism and, and ketone body metabolism, and the second part is immune-related proteins, HLA uh, and interferon-related proteins, which, as I said, were more known. Uh, but actually looking at these uh, um, metabolic proteins, these were actually not known at all and cannot be seen uh, on the RNA level in terms of association with a response. And again, making a very long uh, functional story very short, we could verify knocking out ACAT1, so one of the, our signature proteins, when we knocked it out uh, in mouse uh, melanoma cells, we could actually increase dramatically uh, uh, tumor growth. This was associated with reduced MHC uh, presentation, with reduced interferon response. So basically, when these proteins are more highly expressed, as in the responders in our case, uh, um, tumors grow much slower due to the very high uh, uh, response of the immune system against the tumor. Now, a very interesting follow-up on this uh, that we are kind of uh, finalizing or finalized recently uh, is taking this very large cohort. We actually overall have uh, 174 melanoma samples, and kind of digging more into these data, we could see that we have very high diversity 
of tumor uh, of metastatic locations. So melanoma, since it's so highly metastatic, we are actually never looking at the primary tumor. We are only looking at metastasis, especially in the context of uh, immunotherapy. And what uh, Lil in my lab realized that uh, we have many samples from lymph nodes, subcutaneous metastasis, lung metastasis, and some other organs. And we can actually start doing some uh, functional analysis to see whether we can discriminate between tumors based on their metastatic location and to see whether we can find signatures of metastatic locations which can be associated also uh, with tumor response. And functional analysis uh, of this, so, so we could actually find dozens of proteins that are specific to each metastatic location. And we could find functional annotations related to these. Uh, so, for example, we had a lot of metabolic pathways associated with liver metastasis, which we thought could be related to some kind of technical artifact, but when looking at key liver proteins, they are not high in these tumors. So, this is actually metabolism in the cancer cells, which is somewhat similar, more similar to the liver. Uh, uh, metabolism. And we could also see, for example, that lung metastasis a very high immune-related uh, proteins that coincide also with mitochondrial uh, metabolism and mitochondria, mitochondria in general. And based on the proteins that were high in the lung metastasis, we also predicted them to be associated with better response. And this is something that we could actually verify looking at uh, doing epidemiological analysis and seeing that patients with lung metastasis have actually better response to uh, immunotherapy, and specifically anti-PD-1, which was very interesting. And then further focusing on the lung metastasis, which really intrigued us, we could uh, again perform unsupervised clustering within this group, and we could separate to three different clusters which were significantly associated with response. So we had two clusters with better response, but one cluster of, uh, of, um, of uh, lung metastasis with very poor response. And this was actually when we uh, examined the immune score, so extent of immune infiltration that we can see in the data, we could see a clear association with the immune score, which explains uh, the difference in survival. Uh, and we could, interestingly, and I'm not going into this, we could actually see two patterns of immune response. So the highest survival is more associated uh, um, with interferon signaling, uh, but the second cl cluster two was uh, associated uh, with uh, other immune responses, which was very uh, intriguing and, again, kind of the baseline for further uh, investigation. Now, how are we starting to merge all of these things? Uh, what we want to do in the future is basically examine the question of differences between responders and non-responder on the single cell level. We want to ask how these uh, population, the cell populations change upon treatment, and how generally is the association between immune and metabolic activity uh, in different metastatic locations and in different cell populations. And since uh, clinical samples uh, or fresh clinical sample for single cell analysis is are more difficult, we start off with mouse model of B16. Uh, we have the naive mice and melanoma associated lung metastasis. And in the preliminary analysis, we are sorting a thousand cells from 13 different populations. So these are still not single cells, uh, but rather pools of a thousand cells, but we are uh, separating to 13 different populations, myeloid, lymphoid, and cancer and stroma uh, populations. And just looking at the numbers, we can see more than 1,000 proteins per pool uh, from almost all populations, and for example, macrophages, almost 2,000 proteins. So we were very encouraged by this preliminary result. Now, already looking at the proteins, we can see uh, just clustering these different cell populations, we can see that, first of all, the, the clustering makes sense, the same groups of um, uh, cell population. And we can also very clearly see uh, key markers of each of these cell populations. So this is kind of very encouraging uh, towards doing the whole, the entire big analysis. 
So just to summarize, uh, analysis of breast cancer tumor heterogeneity unraveled the functional significance of heterogeneity. Uh, towards single cell analysis, we automated the SP3 and scope, SP3 scope MS method that enabled us to identify hundreds of proteins per cell. The melanoma analysis unraveled association between immune activity and mitochondrial lipid metabolism, and we found high variability among metastatic locations to be associated uh, with treatment response. And with the pooled cell population, we could unravel cell-specific markers and processes. But with this, I want to finish and thank all the people involved in, in my lab, Maria, Gali, Licha, Lir, Anjana, I mentioned, I showed pictures of them uh, throughout the talk. Uh, and then my clinical collaborators, uh, uh, that really I couldn't do anything without them. I want to thank you for the attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you for this really inspiring talk. To give our more than 80 attendees some more time to type in their questions, I may start with one or two questions. So. Um, what we also see and what your lab is really a leading lab in is characterizing this metabolic changes, metabolism changes and switching in cancer, especially in responding, non-responding tumors. And uh, one of the principal questions there is um, what is driving those metabolic switching? Is it uh, genetic alterations or could it be more organ-wide differences, for example, comorbidities that somebody with diabetes or obese people have uh, a certain propensity to go in a certain direction of response. Have you looked into that? So uh, I don't know about uh, um, association with the genetics of the tumors, but I would say probably not that uh, associated with that. Uh, probably more epigenetic changes and environmental changes. Um, also because we see kind of within the same tumors multiple phenotypes, uh, especially in breast cancer. Uh, but, but in relation to, to the patient metabolic state, this is a very interesting question. Uh, and we are looking into it specifically in melanoma. Uh, we want to associate, uh, so, so first of all, having association with lipid metabolism, what we are asking now, uh, is whether uh, it has any association with the clinical parameters of the patient, so lipid metabolism uh, in the patient, uh, or even drugs that the patient is taking, uh, where we want to ask whether a combination of immunotherapy together with metabolic drugs, for example, anti-diabetic drugs, could improve uh, the efficacy of response. So these are things that we are really looking into these days, so combining epidemiological analysis with our findings, uh, hopefully will give us the answer, but we're not there yet. Interesting. So uh, Eliska first is asking, did you see any significant differences in stroma on a proteome level related to the different clinical features? Uh, in the stroma? Yeah, stroma specific effects um, according to the different clinical features, probably the outcome or uh, subtypes. Uh, um, I, so we didn't analyze yet the stroma itself, so uh, the ECM itself we haven't analyzed yet, but uh, so, so this would be kind of the next step, uh, but we couldn't see a very clear thing. One thing that we asked and kind of did get an answer and left it is whether internal regions of the tumor are different from external regions that are mo more exposed to the environment. Uh, we didn't see significant differences, and we moved on. Uh, it doesn't mean that they don't exist, that they just weren't significant in our data. Uh, so I cannot say a very clear thing about it, but just that we are going to analyze all this trauma, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to associate uh, this trauma with some clinical features of the tumor cells. This is really very, I'm looking forward to these analyses. So as a next question, Nils Blütgen, one of our local bioinformatics professor and leaders here in Berlin is asking, would the single cell strategy also work for fossil proteomics? Would it increase sensitivity when going to targeted proteomics? 
okay, so Phospho, uh, I think it will be the next challenge. There have been attempts by uh, some people to do it, but I think that the main question is that you really have to be sure that what you're looking at is actually true and not some kind of noise level signal. Uh, so I would say not yet, but I'm hopeful that in the future. And regarding the targeted, I definitely think that that would be a good approach. So there are uh, mass spec based uh, or, or methodological mass spec approaches that uh, simplify it. And I think that's definitely an interesting way to go, potentially also for phospho. Um, but uh, yeah, not yet, I would say. Tim Fugman is asking, have you looked at association of heterogeneity caused by viral infections of cancer cells or also immune cell infiltration, like an EBV Epstein-Barr virus? Uh, no, we didn't look at viruses uh, at all. We, look at Im we did look at immune infiltration. We didn't see any significant differences. Also, when we looked at the, uh, where we see higher immune-related uh, proteins, uh, we checked, uh, did basically analysis, uh, kind of machine learning uh, based analysis of the uh, H&E staining and we didn't see significant differences. We saw minor differences that were not statistically significant. We saw a bit higher infiltration where we also saw a higher immune response, so, but, but it was not significant. So th there is some association, but... Uh, Definitely contributing to it, yes. Jana Stutz is thanking you for the talk, obviously, and also asks if there are, if you have any mechanistic insights on how the proline biosynthesis pathways could mediate treatment resistance. Yeah, there, there are uh, different ways. Uh, so proline biosynthesis also, so what we showed is that proline biosynthesis uh, also drives glycolysis, basically. So we have a lot of metabolic analysis uh, of perturbed cells that I didn't show you. Um, uh, so it drives glycolysis and it also induces uh, oxidative stress resistance. So that's probably a part of uh, chemo resistance. Uh, there is another way um, Probably proline also affect collagen uh, deposition, uh, collagen production. Um, so we also think that this could have an effect on collagen and tumor rigidity and uh, or stromal rigidity also can affect um, um, chemo response. So I think somehow these things can all go together. So these are hints towards that, but um, that's what we think probably. Uh, my hunch is that probably the metabolic effect is the most uh, immediate immediate one, but it could also be that there is a stromal impact uh, associated with it. Good. There's another question by Patricia Ebel. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. You have shown here and in your publications various different clustering. Is the exact clustering strategy essential for the findings? Or do you generally see similar results with various clustering approaches? Uh, we don't see exactly the same, I would say. Um, we have a lot of success with the consensus clustering approach, which seems to work very well for a lot of analysis, and this also uh, um, gives us kind of confidence in the number of clusters that we want to, to cluster, to have. Uh, not always, um, but yeah, I would say k-means clustering some probably usually gives a bit different results. Um, I would, yeah. Right. And this question was from Matthias team, sorry, <laughs> not from Patricia. What? Uh, the question was from somebody else. I read the wrong name. <laughs> Sorry yeah. about that. Great. Um, 
Uh, before we close, I have one more question that's a very practical question for all the clinicians. So you have now shown really exciting examples for longitudinal research where you have multiple samples from individual patients to yes. learn about how they respond. And you also, in your melanoma paper, for example, you showed different patient cohorts and also found very, very exciting effects. So what strategy do you think is best? Are both good to just have large cohorts with different response characteristics? Or if you could decide, or would you always go for longitudinal studies? Longitudinal is very difficult to get. I mean, if, if I could get it for everything, I would definitely go for that. But uh, it's just very difficult to get, at least for us in Israel, to get samples from the same patient, to get this patient to come again and again to be biopsied uh, is not that straightforward. But I would definitely uh, go for that if when, whenever possible. Um, it gives a lot of statistical power. So even from uh, 35 patients, you can actually get really very good insights and very strong statistics, which you can never get when you look at um, much fewer. So yeah. mm -hmm. whenever possible, I would do that. Okay, great. This was a very inspiring talk and very inspiring discussion. Thank you a lot for that. And, thank you very uh, thank much. You. Yeah.